without much ado, we would like to thank the AUP delegation, representatives, head of the university, Ma'am Arceli, for welcoming us so warmly in this very cute Finster Hall for our regional convention and definitely by May 2024, the National Convention of AXCO will also be held here. So thank you very much and again, thank you for coming. Thank you. We will also listen, say greetings will be given by Dr. Betty Cernon Makan, the president of Silliman University. And at the same time, he, she is also the president of the Association of Christian Schools, Colleges, and Universities. Let us watch and listen to her greetings. Esteemed colleagues, administrators, and teachers, I extend a warm welcome to each of you at this pivotal zonal convention. As we delve into the theme of leading and communicating innovations in higher education, may our discussions pave the way for transformative advancements in academia. As we come together in the spirit of unity, wisdom, and collaboration, in this opportunity to come together as key university members entrusted to lead and innovate in this current scenario of higher education, we are greatly appreciative of the talents and expertise we have in this program. May this event fuel our minds and actions, enabling us to work together for the betterment of our educational institutions and the students we serve. Let our discussions be productive, our interactions be harmonious, and our endeavors be guided by wisdom and compassion. May this academic activity strengthen us for the tasks ahead and fill us with God's love and unity and our interactions be marked by respect and understanding and that our work be a reflection of Christ's purpose in our individual institutions. Congratulations to the organizers and may this be a productive event. Thank you very much, Dr. Betty, for that warm greetings. We're done with that. Now we are now ready to listen to the first resource speaker. And uh, I am privileged and greatly honored to be doing this in his behalf or whoever his supposedly representative to do this. <laughs> this was just handed to me. Let me read. Dr. Ralph Jason Guanco is a clinical neuropsychologist in the Philippines. He is currently an assistant professor in the Adventist University of the Philippines graduate and undergraduate psychology program. He is also the approved global engagement representative for the Philippines and a newsletter editor in the International Neuropsychological Society and the vice president of the Philippine Society for Clinical Neuropsychology International affiliate of the American Psychological Association. He is also a member of the International Association of Applied Psychology and member of the Psychological Association of the Philippines. He is a dedicated mental health professional 
who has traveled to countries in Southeast Asia and location throughout the Philippines to advocate for sound brain behavior relationship, help the community flourish, provide mental health consultation, and train willing volunteers to promote mental health awareness. So without so much to do, let us give the time to Dr. Ralph Jason Guang. morning. Hello everyone. <laughs> are you okay? And are you happy? Can you smile first? I want to see your smile, beautiful smiles. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm privileged for this opportunity and I would like to thank uh, the invitation. I think uh, Dr. Gamarro invited me. <laughs> and Dr. Rosario for this. So, uh, right this moment, uh, I'll be sharing with you a very important uh, topic that could help us in terms of navigating our psychological well-being. Well, you've been hearing a lot of mental health lectures about um, our life right now in this world, and this presentation will just be very short uh, it's KISS. I'll just make it, uh, I'll keep it simple and short so that everyone will be able to uh, grasp the concept in the best that you can. Now, uh, I'll be uh, first defining psychological well-being. So, uh, here you can see from several studies about the definition of psychological well-being. Well, there are so many theoretical or conceptual frameworks that could be associated to psychological well-being. But upon uh, researching on this, uh, this is what I've got. First, the combination of feeling good, functioning effectively, and then you should have a meaning and purpose in life. So we'll start from that. And you know, my dear Christian educators, this is a core feature of mental health. If Christian educators are not giving much attention to this, for sure, there will be an, a great or huge impact to their psychological well-being or to, to their overall mental health. Now, um, let's first uh, have some uh, readings from the news out there. Well, during the pandemic, you see several concerns of our students, right? And you see, there are so many news associated to their deadlines, the pressures, and it led to some issues associated to suicide. That's the outcome, the end, when they couldn't handle themselves anymore. Let me just, okay? So that's from the pandemic era or the COVID-19 pandemic. And you see so many issues, so many concerns that they're experiencing when it comes to their mental health. In 2023, while I was trying to pre prepare this presentation, I was uh, skimming through social media uh, and then uh, try to look at other news articles so that I may be able to you know, show to you what is now the current concern of the students or even the Filipino people. According to this, you may be able to see here, 63% of Filipinos believe mental health as one of the most critical issues 
for 2023. This is very sad actually. You know, when you would skim through the social media platforms, you would see a lot of uh, memes or uh, you would see a lot of concerns associated with mental health. And they would say that, uh, why they have these questions. Why is it that there are so many people right now or students right now not just students, but also teachers, who would have, you know, uh, who would post mental health concerns. Like, for example, uh, suicide, uh, depression, anxiety, etc. And you can see here, number of students suffering from mental health issues are growing. The Gen Zs. Several concerns associated to, to this kind of concerns would be related to uh, some concerns about their academics, some concerns about their workloads, some concerns about everything associated to their lives or personal lives. Now, I have this specific study uh, conducted during my dissertation. Uh, and, you know, I was able to confirm these variables, associate variables on how we can safeguard young people. That's the first thing first. I mean, uh, I would like to highlight first what can we do when it comes to safeguarding our young people. So this is just a very short uh, explanation of what can we do with our young people. First, we have this engaged learning, academic determination, social connectedness, positive perspective, diverse citizenship, and spirituality. And they call this construct thriving quotient. So you, you know, it may be you know, uh, uh, new to you to hear such such word. Thriving quotient uh, is actually a term used to understand the success of our students, and these are the well-researched and um, evidence-based results that would help safeguard our students. So they're engaged, they're academically determined, they're socially connected, they have this positive outlook in life, and they have this, uh, this sense of service to other people, which could lead to making a difference to the lives of other people or to their fellow students. And the most important thing is that they have this high level of spirituality. I think, you know, we can incorporate this. This is something that could help us thrive in during uncertainties, even with or without the pandemic. Now, uh, we've been trying to understand the struggles of students. Let's proceed to the struggles of teachers. During the COVID-19 pandemic, you will see a lot of studies associated to the struggles and concerns of teachers. There's a rise of mental health problems. And they do not know how to handle it well. And this is a call for concern during that time. They, I mean, they, it was a call for concern during that time where you may be able to see some mental health concerns right there. Like, for example, stress. What else? Burnout, anxiety, depression, self-harm, PTSD, domestic violence, and behavioral problems. And you know, it did not stop. It continued until now. There are so many teachers that are currently experiencing this kind of concerns. And let me share you the, some of the findings that would help us, you know, that would enlighten us when it comes to the struggles of our Christian educators or those individuals in, in, uh, in the Philippines. And you can see here, there's a news. Stress is pushing many teachers out of the profession. What could be the possible problem behind that? What could be the possible reason behind this specific concern? And you can see there's a study from the International Journal of Environmental Research in Public Health. Stress, burnout, and anxiety among teachers are actually prevalent right now. It's, it's an evident concern that must be 
addressed. And what could be the possible reasons? You know, uh, there are so when I was trying to look at the the support associated to these concerns, there are so many things that could be explained or that could help us or that could enlighten us on why is it that there are so many people or there, there are uh, Christian educators or teachers who may be out of the profession or who may be suffering from mental health issues. And I'd like to share with you one study. Okay, So it, it's from the study of Chris Feld, Felsing, long working hours are known to influence well-being adversely and at the same time, heavy and challenging teaching workloads. So you see, and this is, uh, when I was trying to look at, is it really a significant concern? You know, when I was trying to look at the, the other studies, it is. There are so many literature that could support this. And one of those literature that I found would be from that cross field. And what, it was supported by Banal, which is a, a Philippine study. Teachers who, mo- who work more than 45 to 50 hours per week suffer more often from inability to recover and emotional exhaustion than teachers who work less than 40 hours per week. So if I try to look at that, what could be the possible reason? Why is it that there's longer working hours? Okay, I'm not telling that I <laughs> reduce the working. I don't, I'm not sure about the workloads that you may have right now. <laughs> but this is what I found. And this is a reality that's happening right now. And adversely, it contributes to the well-being. It affects negatively the well-being. And, you know, when trying to look at some explanations about it, I, I, I found this one. The psychological flow. Well, uh, to explain to you psychological flow, flow refers to a mental state of complete immersion in an activity where an individual is fully focused and engaged. And the author of this, Chekhsant Mihai, Mihaly Chekhsant Mihai, suggests that uh, finding engaging activities that promote flow can contribute significantly to a person's overall well-being in life satisfaction. And when you try to look at this uh, picture right there, when a skill does not match the challenge, there's a problem. There will be a problem. And it would lead to anxiety, boredom, and then other negative problems. So you can see the figure right there. The goal here is actually to feel a sense of control over our actions. We've seen that there could be a lot of workloads. There could be several concerns about um, their personal lives. They could not balance work and life. And that is a call for attention. And you can see here, when when there's high challenge or high challenging jobs, but it does not match your skill, it would lead to what? Several negative emotions or several negative behaviors. And I hope it must be considered when we try to look for someone that would be fit for the job. You know, that would match the skill and that would match also the challenge given to that job. Because if not, that would add to more stress to that person if he or she cannot, what? Cope with the challenges that will be given or confronted to that, I mean, that will be given to that person. And um, given that there are so many things that are actually affecting the individual or the teacher, it actually would lead to some sleepless nights, right? Sleep, as you can see here, according to study, is actually a common predictor for anxiety disorders or for depression or for other mental health problems. Right now, can you ask yourself, am I anxious? Um, Did you sleep poorly last night? What kind of sleep do you have? Is it quality? 
40 minutes. Wow, okay. That's short. You know, according to studies, um, most Filipinos would sleep at least six hours only. Less than pa. With, uh, yeah, six hours. And uh, the recommended sleep for every individual would be <laughs> six to eight. Oh, that's our less than six hours, you know? That's actually very lit, um, concerning. Well, let me share with you this very important study. Here, insufficient sleep amplifies level of anxiety. And deep sleep helps reduce such stress. This is a study of Simon, a postdoctoral fellow in the Center for Human Sleep Science. And according to him, when you do not sleep, it impairs your frontal lobe. Frontal lobe is a seat for your problem-solving skills or some specific exec executive functioning skills. That's why you cannot focus. You cannot think well. You cannot do things that would help you to be successful or to flourish. And you can see there's a cycle right there. When there's stress and you cannot handle it, it would lead to anxious thoughts and worry. And then what will happen? Sleeplessness and then you cannot cope anymore. And then it's be a continuous cycle until your, uh, your hormones will be affected and then everything is not functioning anymore. Now, let me share with you a figure on the screen where um, I got this when I attended a uh, sleep seminar which was conducted by the uh, Philippine General Hospital, a neuropsychiatric uh, uh, training where they would say that each one of us has this circadian rhythm. Well, circadian rhythm are ultimately physiological and behavioral changes that occur on a daily cycle that could affect our bodily systems. And it was even based on the Bible that there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. You can see here that uh, most deaths uh, for high blood pressure would be at 6.45 a.m. according to study. So you can see it there. So sharpest uh, blood pressure rise, then melatonin, melatonin secretion stops at 7.30 a.m. And then your higher alertness level would be at 10 a.m. That's why um, most webinars or most uh, seminars would suggest that we conduct our seminars at 10 a.m. most of the time. Because that's where you are alert at 10 a.m. And then noon, and then 2.30 p.m. is the best coordination time. Because noon, uh, 12 to 2.30 p.m. would be for the nap, napping. You know, just you know, for you to refresh everything about what you can think of or what you can do for the future. And then after that, 3.30, fastest reaction time. 5 p.m., greatest cardiovascular efficiency in muscle strength. That's why most of uh, those who are in the gym would exercise at that time. And then at 6 p.m., and then 6.30 p.m. again. That's the highest blood pressure. And then 9 p.m., your melatonin would start secreting again. I mean, it would start secreting, not again. It would start secreting, and it would stop at 7.30 a.m. And the deepest sleep is 2 a.m., and the lowest body temperature at 4 a.m. So what can we learn from this? No, yeah, I will keep repeating this one. There is always a time for everything under the heavens. And if you do not listen to your body, if you do not listen to what your body is telling you, for sure, you'll have a lot of physical health concerns. Not just physical health concerns, but neuropsychological concerns. You cannot think well. You cannot process your thoughts well. So here, um, uh, I'll share with you a study where in, this is a meta-analytic study that uh, 30 reports across the world that which supports the, what I am telling you right now that at 6 a.m., that's the time for uh, where many are suffering from myocardial infarctions or uh, heart, heart attack. And for most people, uh, as what I have mentioned, it, it rises at 
yeah, at 6.45 a.m. And they call that morning surge. So, you know, if we cannot try to balance everything and try to understand Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1, you know, this may be something that uh, would lead to some concerns if you will not be able to uh, look at this as a very important thing to understand. Now, if you will ask me when is the best time to drink your, uh, I mean, to take your, your high blood pressure pills, you ask your doctor. <laughs> you may have this thoughts right now. Or you may ask, but because that's the common question, when is the best time to, to you know, take your medication? Because according to the circadian rhythm, at 6.45 a.m., that would be the time for you to, what? I mean, that's the morning surge or the highest uh, blood pressure. Well, uh, according to what I am reading, but do not follow this, okay? <laughs> according to what I am reading, it's best to consult your physician. Okay, so here, according to my reading physician, uh, they recommend uh, taking the medication at night. That's the recommendation. But it's up to you. You consult your physicians because I may not know your biological um, system or your physical body. It's best that you consult your physician about this. Okay? So that's from a study. Now, um, aside from sleep concerns, there are other risk factors. What are those risk factors? First, a history of mental illness in the family. Genetics. You know, it could affect the functioning of the person. And then stressful life situations, ongoing medical condition, traumatic experience, history of abuse, and a previous mental illness. If a teacher, if a Christian educator wouldn't be able to, to address this, the concern that is happening to him or her herself, then... This is what will happen. So it's like, you know, um, there's a pilot and there's cabin crews. The cabin crews are those individuals that would assist you to be better. The pilot is you. How do you control those, the, the plane, your mind? So here, when the SNS, the sympathetic nervous system, would keep on functioning, would keep on surging, and you cannot control it anymore, then it will hijack your stress response. That's why um, we, when you are not able to control it, automatically there are stress responses that you do not notice. But you feel like you're shivering. It, it, it appears that you're, you feel anxious. You feel you cannot control yourself. And you can see when there's a stressful event, you can see there's autonomic stress system, you, your parasympathetic nervous system, which is actually a, a part of our body responsible for us to to rest and relax but because you cannot rest and relax it will continue and then you would say ah, kaya pa. I can do it I'll push more and then what would happen because you keep on pushing more despite that it's already a concern for you it would lead you to be exhausted to be frustrated about it and you cannot think well and at most of the time you would forget things diba? You would miss things. You would not be able to think clearly. So those are the, the other, I mean, the, the other words that you could uh, hear. It's too much. I'll never be able to do it at all. You are good at presentations, but you should feel guilty about your performance. I'm embarrassed that I'm always late. Life is too hard. So those are those uh, possible thoughts. That's why, as a person who knows that there is a time for everything. As a person who is knowledgeable in, about this kind of concerns, you need to make sure that you will be successful under stress. And you should have what? A conscious control. That's why control is very, very important. And later on, Dr. Gumara will share with us some of the things that could help you control yourself. Because maybe it's too much. Everything that is too much is bad. And look at this. This is from a study of rat, of uh, rat lift. You know, pag wala naman tayong ginagawa naman po, di ba? Parang we feel like parang nangangalawang. Yun ang sinasabi nila. And that's the term, you know, rust out. 
But if we're doing something more and more and more and more and more, and you cannot control yourself anymore, it would lead to burnout. You can see the green there. That's the comfort zone. That's the optimum level of functioning. Where you can still function well and you can be effective in what you're doing. But there's what we call zone of delusion. You feel that you can do everything even though you cannot do it anymore. You are having a zone, you may be having in the zone of delusion. So you see, uh, there's a concern now. So what can we do about that? We'll stay in that comfort zone or in that stretch. You know, um, every one of us has this capacity to really stretch, to, you know, to be able to get to our highest capacity. However, there will be a time where the stress stretch is too much. Like for example, the ba yung uh, ano nga yan? rubber band. When it's too much stretch, what will happen? It will break. So you see, strain, and then you're overwhelmed, overwhelmed, fatigue, poor judgment, decision making, and then serious health problems. Our goal, as much as possible, is on that comfort zone only. And I think this is my second to the last slide. You can see this. Um, since I'm really focused on the brain behavior, I'm really fascinated with the brain. So I really pursued, you know, understanding it in the best that I can. So when I was trying to read this one, um, I used the Bible, I used the research to support this figure. So you can see here, um, this is an unstressed brain. You can see the direction are linear. So you can think well. You can decide well. You can really think effectively. And it may appear that your cognition will be functioning properly. And when you are stressed, as you can see here, there's weaker control of thoughts, your emotions, and your actions. And you know, according to studies, even relatively mild stress can impair the prefrontal cortex. And this is the seat, the seat of our decision making. When you are in a state of stress, too much stress, it, can, it could impair. Uh, a Harvard, this is actually from a Harvard study, that uh, this is one of the most you know, common effects of the brain when you are really stressed. Normally, an alert person's brain has a moderate amount of chemical messengers that lead to the prefrontal cortex to take charge and perform high level of thinking. But if the stress is very high, it can flood the brain. So you can look at that. Parang kung saan saan na pumupunta yung mga ating na iisip. It would lead to several, you know, directions, and that's very, you know, difficult to handle because. Wag na natin hintayin that you'll come to a point where you'll be admitted to the National Center for Mental Health. Yeah, that's re the reality if you cannot handle yourself. That's why here in Proverbs 25, 28, you need to have self-control. A person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. There's no defense because they're broken already. And I have this favorite um, author. The mind needs to be controlled for it has the most powerful influence upon the health. And when indulged, it brings severe forms of disease upon the afflicted. When you do not know how to control yourself, then you may be one of my patients in the future. Okay? So you'll consult me. <laughs> And you will tell me about these concerns. Well, mental health is a common concern. Every one of us has some concerns about our mental health, right? But one, one important thing that you should understand is to control. To make sure that you do not stretch yourself too much. You ask yourself, Kamusta kaya ako? You look in the mirror. Uh, have you asked yourself that question? When you, you talk to yourself in the mirror and then ask yourself, am I okay? <laughs> oh, pero you should be rational when you think, when you talk to yourself. Baka kasi you're talking in the mirror and then a student sees you, 
Oh, ma'am, what are ha- what's happening to you? <laughs> okay, yeah. You, you know, better we will we'll check ourselves. Um, let me share with you this. This is a last slide for me. Self-care is not selfish or self-indulgent. We cannot nurture others from a dry well. So kung kayo po ay wala na rin, ano, you know, uh, energies, rest muna konti. Kasi para, and para efficient yung cognition natin. We need to take care of our own needs also. And then, we can give from our surplus, our abundance. So, my dear Christian educators, as we passionately embrace our mission and vision, that's our title, our, our, our theme, dedicated to crafting groundbreaking programs and sharing the wealth of our best practices to our co-teachers and to our students. I would like to encourage you to wholeheartedly commit to leading our learners by example. To thrive in constant presence of God. And I hope uh, we can make it a heartfelt reality to prioritize our well-being also. Ensuring that we are in the best possible position to extend the genuine care and support to those students entrusted to our care. So you look at yourself right now. I hope that as you go out after the topics, everything about it, try to check on yourself. It's not a sin to check yourself. It's actually really good that you would check yourself so that you would be efficient in what you do. Okay, thank you so much and God bless us all. There is no health without mental health. Thank you so much.